Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Romans uh, is a letter that a bloke called Paul wrote to God's mob who lived in the greatest city of the world in Rome. And he's writing to them to say, hey, we're on about the same thing. Why don't we work towards telling people about Jesus together? We're going to read Romans 3, 21 to 26. But now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. That is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. He presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Have you ever heard the phrase, it isn't fair? Everyone nods. Uh, In its purest form, uh, it's a phrase we use to confront a lack of justice, isn't it? Uh, When we see a wrong being committed. Uh, We often utter it when our sense of what is right is offended or when evil seems to triumph over good. Sometimes we can use that phrase in an accusation, can't we? And more often than not, I've heard it used as an accusation towards God. You're not fair, God. You're not fair. Why did that person have to go? Why did that event have to take place? Why did that disaster emerge? Why did that crime go unpunished? Uh, Let me tell you, I've uttered that sentiment. I've even experienced it. It isn't fair. The deeper issue, though, is not the issue of fairness. I I think that's the surface issue. The deeper issue is the issue of justice, isn't it? Is God just? Does God do what is right? And that's what we're going to look at today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can open it. Thanks for fans and windows that are open. Thanks for such a mob gathered. Our Father, we come from many different backgrounds today, many different weeks, looking at many different weeks ahead. Our Father, some of us are stressed, some relaxed, some really tired, some really excited, some energised, some just really exhausted. Father, over the next few minutes, as we look at your nature as just, help us to see that you are just, that you deal with evil and sin and injustice and you do it gloriously in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. The Bible is very clear. I'm going to have most of the references up here. So as we jump through, uh, you'll see them up here on the overhead. The Bible is very clear. It's God's word about himself, uh, about what he's done in the world. And the Bible is very clear that God is just. Uh, It's an assertion, a statement about God that's made right throughout the Bible, uh, in the old bit and in the new bit. It's consistent. Uh, Let me just give you a few examples. There's a bloke called Abraham. Uh, Abraham's having a chat with God about the judgment God's going to bring on a notorious city called Sodom. You might have heard of Sodom. Uh, As Abraham stands and chats with God about the judgment God is about to bring on that city, Abraham expresses a very clear understanding about God's nature. You could not possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? You understand that statement, don't you? You might have even uttered those phrases. God, you're the judge of the world. You're the creator and the sustainer. As the judge, I trust that you will not act in any other way except being just. We'll get to that in a moment. I trust that you will not kill the righteous with the wicked in your judgment. The account that immediately follows shows the nature of God. Abraham and God have discussed and God has promised that 
He will not destroy the city if 10 righteous people are found there. And then what does God do to the city? He destroys it, doesn't he? Because he couldn't find 10 righteous people. We see God is just. He does exactly as he promises. And we actually see the measure, the standard for God's justice. It's something called righteousness. And we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, A few years later, well, perhaps hundreds of years later, a bloke called Moses is gathered with God's mob. Uh, They're at the edge of a wonderful land that God has promised them, way back to that bloke called Abraham. And as they prepare to go into that land, uh, Moses sings to the people of God. Don't worry, I'm not going to mimic him today. And as he sings to the people of God, you would have heard this in the reading Elizabeth brought us, he describes the nature of God. Again, Deuteronomy 32, the rock His work is perfect. All his ways are just. A faithful God without bias. He's righteous and true. God is perfect. There's no blemish in him. There's no movement in the very essence of who God is. As such, he's thoroughly consistent. He's the kind of referee I want on Monday nights at touch football. There's no bias. There's no prejudice. There's no wrong decisions with God. And the measure of that immovable nature is his righteousness. His decisions are without bias and he does exactly as he promises. The account that follows immediately afterwards shows that. As God's people go into that land, those who are evil are confronted and those who trust in this God are spared without bias. Wow. There's a bloke called Job in God's word. Uh, Job seems to have experienced the pain of this broken world in a really sharp way, sharper than I've ever experienced. Uh, As Job is suffering in this world, his mates come and sit down and have a chat with him. Uh, His mates are pretty thoughtless. They're not kind of delivering the truth in a wise way. But the content of what they're saying is true. It's impossible for God to do wrong for the Almighty to act unjustly, for he repays a person according to his deeds. He gives him what his conduct deserves. Indeed, it's true that God does not act wickedly and the Almighty does not pervert justice. That's in line with everything we've already seen. God is fair. God is just. When he judges, he does so on the facts in front of him, thoughts, words and deeds. God doesn't make a wicked decision. There is no miscarriage of justice with God. And we see that in immediately what follows, just like we have with the previous two. And Job is restored by God and God displays his nature. Let's skip forward on fast forward several hundred years. Uh, This time we're with a bloke called Paul. He's the bloke who wrote that book called Romans that we're looking at now. Uh, Paul's in a city called Athens, which is known for its wisdom. In fact, one of the favourite pastimes of that that city was for all the wise people to gather together and have a chin wag and sort out the problems of the universe, the original table of knowledge. Uh, Paul turns up on that day and he talks to these people. Uh, This is what he says about God. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he set a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He's provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Uh, That's exactly what we've just heard. Uh, God's word is very consistent. God is the judge of the world and he'll do that judgment rightly. Justly. In fact, he set a day, a day of judgment. And on that day, he set a judge, a judge who he has shown has all authority and power because God raised him from the dead. The Bible is very clear. God is the judge of the world and God is just. And consistently it exposes the measure for God's decisions. It's it's a measure called righteousness. God can't be bribed, God's without bias, God is always fair, he is truthful and unchanging, he'll be the same today as he was yesterday and tomorrow and he'll judge on the basis of what is in front of him, thoughts, words and deeds. 
But let me just pause before we unpack that a little more because I want to ask two questions. Well, what does it mean to be just? We use that phrase often, don't we? Have you ever sat down to create a definition of what just means? I I found it really hard this week. Really hard to think about what that looks like. But from what we've just seen, it means for God to be consistent in decisions and judgments. There is a consistency and there is a truthfulness. In this case, it is to confront sin and it means sinners receive what they deserve. It's to confront sin so that sinners receive what they deserve. I think that's the definition of just that we get out of the picture of God in the Bible, which leads to the second question, what's the foundation for that? And the foundation for that justice is God's righteousness. Uh, The word righteous is one we used often. It's a very simple word. It basically means ruler in line with that standard. And the standard is what? The standard is God, his nature, who he is. Uh, We've heard a lot about the nature of God. God's holy. There's nothing like him. He can't stand this thing that Seamus talked about called sin, not just black T-shirts. God can stand black T-shirts. God can't stand thoughts, words and deeds. Thoughts, words and deeds that go against him. So when we say God is just, we're saying he judges in line with himself, who he is. And God makes fair decisions in that way. So point three on your outline, it means we've got a significant problem, us people, haven't we? It means we've got a very significant problem. Uh, let, me, let me describe it. Elizabeth touched on this in Psalm 53. In fact, Paul's quoting Psalm 53 and Psalm 10 and Psalm 14 as he writes this. As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. No one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless or useless. There's no one who does what's good, not even one. Do, do you catch the problem? If the standard of God's decision is righteous, there is no one righteous. When God puts us against that measure, we're all crooked. In fact, a little later he says we've all fallen short of God's standard. We don't measure up, not one of us by our own nature. Not one of us measures up to the measure that God uses left to our own desires. Do you see the problem? And the description of that problem is very simple. Seamus has raised it. It's a very simple word. It's the word sin. The depth of the problem is underestimated. The depth of the problem is captured there in that second last line. All alike have become worthless or literally useless. To put it literally, we can't even be what we're made to be. We can't even be truly human because we can't bear the image of the one who made us. The reality of the problem can't be denied. Everyone dies. That's the result of turning away from the author of life. And the way out of it? I'd love to say it's education. I'd love to say it's working harder. I'd love to say it's a good family pedigree or just being gooder. No one will be declared right with God by works of the law because knowledge of the sin comes through what God has said. I think our inability in this area is captured in the way we so often cry it's not fair. Do we really want God to be fair? Do we really want God to give us what we deserve? Do we really want to shake our fist at God and say, actually, God, you got it wrong. I really want you to be fair with me. Wouldn't that be horrific, given the problem that we've got? And at this very moment when our problem is so insurmountable, I'm at point four on the outline, 
At that very moment, something remarkable happens. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there's no distinction. Uh, Do you notice what God has done there? God has actually sent in a human form his standard in, in our shape. Two arms, two legs, two eyes, a mouth, a nose, two ears, a head, born, raised, flesh. God has sent in a human form his standard of what it means to be just. And that is a living, breathing, walking, talking, sleeping, eating, crying, tired display of the nature of God. In this world, Jesus represents God perfectly, his nature and he lives a life we could never live. And God sent him, and then God did something with him. God presented him. God presented him as the mercy of propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate God's righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Do you remember last year, Jess helped us understand a really tricky word? It's a word that starts with P, propitiation. Jesus stood in for us. God presented him and God put him in front of us because he lived the life we couldn't live. So Jesus takes all that we deserve. Jesus takes all of the judgment of God and deals with the problem we face. He takes it on our behalf. Now, let me be very clear what this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that every human being is suddenly okay with God. Just because you've got a physical body like Jesus doesn't mean that everything he did is now yours. He came for you. But I hope you captured that key word that we had a number of times. What is it? Believe through faith. The key word, how do you receive what Jesus has done? By taking him at his word, by saying that really is who Jesus is and that's really what he's done. It's not available just to the well-behaved, the good, the well-mannered, the well-educated, because there's no distinction. We're all sinful. It's received by anyone who trusts what Jesus has done. Here here is what it sounds like. Anyone who trusts what Jesus has done receives what Jesus has done. Anyone who trusts what Jesus has done receives what Jesus has done. And it's free. It's a gift. That's that word grace. Grace. And as God sent Jesus and then God presented Jesus, God then demonstrated something about himself. God presented him as the propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate what? God's character. God presented him down further to demonstrate his nature, his righteousness at the present time so that we could see that God is just and the one who justifies. Jesus is the public statement that God deals with sin. He confronts it, he judges it, and he pays the penalty for it. God takes sin seriously and God deals with it. So you you might be able to look back over history and go, how did Roger Rogerson survive so long? Three decades of corruption? God obviously didn't see Roger because he's such a dodger. But no, no, God saw him and God deals with his sin. Not just at the cross, but on that final day. God deals with sin. And at the very moment when God sends, presents and demonstrates with Jesus, what else does God do at that moment? God actually deals with our sin, doesn't he? And so as we trust in what Jesus has done and we receive what Jesus has done, God looks at us and goes, your sin's dealt with. Because of Jesus, you measure up. Is God just? Yeah, God's just. God is just. Just look at Jesus. 
God judges sin and the sinner in line with his nature. God is consistent and faithful without bias. God does so on the basis of the words, thoughts and deeds in front of him. Just look at Jesus. And at that very moment when God deals with sin, he also deals with sinners in a way they don't deserve. So by faith, they receive what Jesus has done. So tomorrow morning you'll wake up. What will this mean? Let me give you four very quick applications. First, tomorrow you can approach life realistically. You know who God is. You know who you are. And every time someone like me, and I will, sometime in the week ahead, I will think, speak or feel God's not fair. I actually now know what that means, don't I? As I ask God to be just. I know what my nature is. I know God's nature and I know how he judges. And that's actually a truth we can share, isn't it? Did you notice in Psalm 53 and then Deuteronomy how it's a truth passed down in the generations in God's people? And we share that truth with each other, both by what we say and sometimes by what we choose not to say. Second, we can approach life with confidence. Does God judge sin? Yes, he does. He's demonstrated that at the cross and he set a final day. No sin will go unpunished. No evil will not be righted. No sinner will avoid accountability. In a world where I am so frustrated that we humans skew, misapply or just ignore justice, God is just. Sin will be judged and when it is, there will be no miscarriage of justice. No miscarriage. Now, that doesn't mean that I now approach tomorrow with that kind of, you know, Lion King attitude, just shrug my shoulders and get on with things and grin. I still take sin seriously. God still calls us to expose injustice and bring them to light, but I can do that with confidence because God is just. In fact, it might even boil down to the way I deal with the wrongs committed against me. I can be quick to forgive, can't I? Because God is just. My job's not the judging eternally. That's God's job. And I can be quick to forgive. Third, we approach life with assurance. If you trust in Jesus, what's happened to your sin? It's done. So when you approach that final day, there's not a maybe. There's no, I I hope this is true. There's no perhaps in Jesus, your sin is judged and you've received everything he has ever done. Finally, we approach life with urgency. Let me say, if you are sitting here today and you don't trust in Jesus, there is an urgency to Monday. There is an urgency because if you don't trust Jesus, are you willing to stand before this just God and defend your life? Are you willing to stand before the just God and defend your own life? There's also an urgency if you know Jesus, because we know many who don't. I'm urgent about a lot of things. I'm urgent about my social life. I'm urgent about community acceptance. I'm urgent about this national crisis or that corruption of power. I'm urgent about politics. I might even be urgent about career, but am I grabbed by the urgency of people who don't know Jesus? Am I grabbed by that? I need to be because God is just. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that you reveal your nature. You are just. And thank you that you reveal the standard in the flesh in Jesus. Thank you that in him you demonstrate that you judge sin and the sinner and simultaneously you save the sinner. Father, Please help me to approach tomorrow. Help us to approach tomorrow realistically with assurance and confidence and with a great urgency.
In Jesus' name. Amen.